I'm Julia Longoria. This is The Experiment. This week's episode is part two of a two-part series. So if you haven't listened to part one, stop right there, go back to last week's episode, and listen to that first. It's the story of how one man, political operative Ralph Reed, built the evangelical voting bloc over decades, and how he helped Donald Trump get elected. Now for part two, Atlantic staff writer Emma Green is going to take it from here. The day after Joe Biden was inaugurated, thousands of people gathered for an event at Calvary Chapel, an evangelical megachurch in Southern California. It's a good group, Jack. Jeez. It's amazing what happens when you keep your church open, right? (laughs) The pastor at Calvary had invited the conservative provocateur Charlie Kirk to speak to the congregation after Trump left office. My goodness. Um, It was hard to watch yesterday. It was. This congregation is exactly the kind that the political operative Ralph Reed dreamed of all those years ago, a powerful church community that took its role in politics seriously. This church did their part. This church registered voters. This church mobilized. People in the evangelical world were trying to figure out what went wrong and who was to blame. And if every church was as involved as this church, especially in this last election, Uh, things would have looked a lot differently. This part was not exactly in Ralph's plan, though. The evangelical voting bloc that he had united was starting to turn on itself. You have pastors that are coming out, and they are saying, we don't like the whole culture war Christianity thing. We're not going to get involved in this election. And Kirk had a message for everyone who sat this election out. You've grown way too comfortable as a Christian in this country. You've been way too part of the mainstream culture, way too part of it. In the conservative Christian world, politics, not faith, has become the litmus test for whether someone belongs. And if you fail that test, the consequences are harsh. You have the Christian rapper Lecrae, who comes out and campaigns for Raphael Warnock. The guy that Kirk is calling out here, Lecrae, is legit Christian famous. He won a couple of Grammys, he's got almost two million followers on Instagram. A lot of evangelical kids grew up listening to him. We all have a very unique opportunity to continue making a difference. Last year, in the midst of a very close special election with control of the Senate at stake, Lecrae performed at a Get Out the Vote rally in Georgia. We are free. We are free now to vote. It was hosted by Democrats, but Lecrae hadn't declared support for any candidate or party. For Lecrae, who's a Christian rapper, he wanted to be loved and accepted by the Democrat power establishment more than standing up for truth. But to evangelicals like Charlie Kirk, this was a betrayal. That's the guy who we're listening to on K-Love, Lecrae, in my personal opinion, should never be allowed to perform in another church after advocating for Raphael Warnock. So Charlie Kirk gets on and he's talking to a pastor and he says, you know, this guy Lecrae is out there campaigning for Warnock and he should not be allowed to perform at any church ever again, right? And um, I just thought it laughable and I thought it was a picture of white supremacy. The architects of the religious right didn't just build a political machine. They built an identity. But recently, that identity has begun to crack. A number of evangelical giants have realized, either slowly or all at once, that their church isn't really theirs, that the politics of the church no longer line up with their values. Or maybe it was always that way, and they just chose to ignore it. This week, the story of Lecrae, who watched his faith become politicized and was forced to pick a side. I'm Emma Green, and this is The Experiment, a show about our unfinished country. Lecrae Moore moved around a lot when he was young, and religion wasn't really a big or stable part of his childhood. 
my only interaction with church as a kid was through my grandmother. She'd have a pulpit and a piano and these old gospel hymns and songs were sang. Some of them didn't have words. It was just like humming and tambourines and clapping and just a lot of shouting. He didn't love church, but he'd play along for his grandmother. I remember her pulling me up when I was about 12 and just asking me to testify. And I didn't know what to do or what to say. And so I just said, I, I thank God I'm not in a gang. And everyone shouted and praised God for that. And and I think that was, you know, a, a unique and kind of strange thing. Lecrae was a brainy kid. He just felt like this charismatic version of Christianity didn't really do a whole lot for him. By the time Lecrae got to college, he had decided to figure out everything he could about God. He studied world religions. He started visiting campus Bible studies. He wasn't sure about what he believed, but he was searching. The Pentecostal leanings that I had kind of experienced as a child were primarily uh, African-American. The way they articulated things was very dynamic and charismatic. But as I moved into the cerebral theological worlds, they were dominated with predominantly white men. And the books that were recommended, you know, from the scholars were white men as well. Was that something that you noticed or thought about at the time? I had never paid attention to it. You know, I didn't really pay attention to that fact. And I I think I wrestled with some, you know, unfortunately, some self-hate in terms of my ethnic uh, culture. it's, It's not overt often, but it's subconsciously you think that white is right because the neighborhoods that look the nicest are white. The people who own the basketball teams are white. And so clearly the the people who are talking to me and telling me about theology, if they're white, then they must be right. And that was a subconscious idea that I had. One day, Lecrae went to a Christian conference, and the way that the pastor described Jesus made everything click into place. The pastor connected all of this abstract theology with the world that Lecrae knew. The pastor mentioned that Jesus was not a pushover. He was relating Christ to like a thug, a gangster. You know, he was like, you want to talk about tough? Tough is being able to hang on that cross and And tough is being able to lay your life down. And it really resonated with me because of the machismo, bravado kind of upbringing I had. Just to hear about a a Jesus who was unashamed and unafraid to take on all of my sin uh, struck me. And I remember that moment just being overcome and overtaken and saying, God, I'm sorry. Will you uh, accept me? Christ through faith. This was Lecrae's moment of conversion, of being born again. He started going to an evangelical church and studying evangelical theology. And he started making music about his faith. Soon, Lecrae's music, earnest, Bible-focused, theologically rigorous, was finding an audience with young Christians at church camps and conferences. He was starting to get popular and performing all over the country. It was as if every weekend a bigger church in a white community was booking me out. And, you know, I was a bit of an anomaly for a lot of these folks for me to dress like I dress and to come from where I come from. But to be able to articulate scripture and dialogue on these weighty topics of theology was amazing to people um, in those circles. And so... There was a sense of just like, man, I'm getting attention. I'm getting love. You're talking about a kid who grew up in a disenfranchised environment, didn't grow up with his father, idolized gang members, and and just wanted to belong. So you got these men telling you you're doing a great job. And I remember being extremely shocked when I had a conversation with John Piper, and he said something to the degree of like, and Lecrae is leading in his area. And I thought to myself, oh, he thinks I'm a leader. And it was like, whoa. 
did you have really strong political views at that time in your life? You know, I, I think as it pertained to politics, I was the pretty typical Christian who didn't have this worldview that included the secular world, so to speak. And so, you know, anything outside of the scope of Jesus in the Bible was pretty much not worth my time. And so I would say politics initially for me was like, meh, that's that's the devil's playground. He can have it. And um, I, I didn't care much for it. Hold on, hold on now. Wait a minute. What's up, Craig? It's 60,000 people. We can do better than that, oh, y'all. Yeah. Let's try this again. Lecrae had plenty going on in his life already. His career was getting bigger and bigger. His songs made it to the Billboard gospel charts and started getting nominated for awards. He was pretty content to avoid politics entirely. Until... If we are unified across racial and regional and religious lines, there's nothing we can't accomplish. I was not a voter, but I know when Obama ran, it was monumental. And I never forget the feeling of like being so proud that a black person had achieved these heights, but feeling as if I couldn't share that in my Christian circles because he was not liked. And I didn't understand why, you know, I, I, I didn't understand what it was. And so I was trying to investigate and see like, what, what is it, what is it about Obama that, that these folks don't like? And, and it would all kind of go back to abortion, which I never heard Obama say I'm for abortion or I, you know, any of those things. I just felt proud that somebody who looks like me could become president. And so I voted for him. You know, I, I didn't know much about his policies. I didn't investigate thoroughly, but I felt like it was almost like a, a civic duty <laughs> to, to do this. You know, you said that you felt like you couldn't share that with people who were in your world. You had this world, you felt really affirmed. You felt like you were really being seen by these leaders in a certain way, but also you were going through this experience where you really were moved by Obama becoming president and you felt like you had to keep that from the people who were in your life. Right. Yeah, I, th I think when you are doctrinally oriented and you are the type of person that's looking to find a hole in someone's argument all the time. And you're all, it's kind of like the Christian police, right? That's, that's kind of the, the tribe I feel like I belong to. You're not safe to talk about these things because they'll be attacked. You know, it's funny because it was most of my black friends who operated in the same space that I did. Like a lot of my black friends in evangelicalism, we all kind of had the same thoughts um, but we just knew to keep our mouth shut. You know, we talked about it amongst each other and then that was it. You know, it's kind of like, uh, you know, the slaves get together in the kitchen and they talk about it and they go back out into the front room and they pretend like nothing's wrong. Lecrae wasn't ready to talk about politics publicly, but it became too difficult to stay quiet about everything that was happening in America. Three weeks ago, Trayvon Martin, an unarmed black teenager, was shot down by a white neighborhood watchman who claimed self-defense and has not at this point been arrested. And when Trayvon Martin was killed, the tragedy of it hit Lecrae hard. So he decided to take a risk and say how he felt. I don't really think I said anything visceral or divisive. I think I was asking a question about how we don't, you know, kind of see each other the same. And I was kind of blasted and attacked. And I was like, wow, this is crazy. I knew to stay away from some of the political stuff, but race, I didn't think people thought was political. I'm a black person. I thought that Trayvon dying was terrible. And I thought all Christians would agree with me. And that's when I found out we staunchly disagree. And they saw this as a political thing, whereas I saw this as a personal thing. Lecrae started to see a disconnect everywhere he looked. Evangelical theology didn't necessarily line up with the way that evangelicals live their lives. He saw evangelical culture paying a lot of lip service to loving people of all races, but evangelical politics often seemed to treat Black people as afterthoughts. I never saw the type of politics that was proposed 
trickle down into my community from conservative Republicans. You know, and I read the books and I, I, I wrestled with the stuff and, you know, talking about trying to be a, a generous capitalist. And I didn't see those Christians. No one was trying to work on the environment or help the young ladies who were, you know, pregnant and already had three kids and the father was in prison. And so it, it wasn't connected. He started to write lyrics about what he saw as hypocrisy in the evangelical world when it came to race. I wrote a song called Dirty Water, which when the song first starts, I toy with the idea where I'm saying, champagne, champagne, celebrating my campaign. I just dug a well in West Africa. What I was saying is there's just this idea in evangelicalism of like, let's go build a well in Africa. Let's go, you know, there's a whole trend. But then it was kind of like, where are your black friends? And then I said another line, no habla español, just show me tu baño. Ain't trying to get to know you, I'm too busy reading Daniel. Where I was saying, like, you don't speak Spanish, you just want what you want from the Hispanic people. Just show me where the bathroom is. I'm not trying to be your friend. I'm busy studying the word. I, I don't want to be friends with these immigrants, so to speak. And then I said the most segregated time of day is Sunday service. Now, what does that say about the God you worship? And I was just trying to poke at these ideas, but I don't think people really grasped what I was trying to say. Ain't no filters in this town. Dirty water. Lecrae was trying to stay apolitical, but by 2016, that was getting a lot harder to do. I saw the political realm encroaching closer into evangelicalism. It was almost as if the two were not separable. And it scared me. And I remember the, the idea of being called an evangelical almost meant you are a conservative Republican. And I wasn't okay with that. You know, I think, I, I mean, most black Christians are progressive Democrats. I mean, these are the choices that were handed, but I wasn't okay with being labeled as a conservative Republican. And it was because I felt like nationalism, which is what I felt like Donald Trump and, and his supporters were aiming for, the type of nationalism that they were supporting was the type of nationalism that would crush the heads of minority citizens. If to be a Christian meant I was that, then that was scary to me. One night in 2016, Lecrae was performing at a concert in upstate New York. It was his usual audience, mostly white Christians. And people were wearing Make America Great Again shirts all throughout the crowd in upstate New York. So I was like, why does this look so similar to Texas or Georgia or Tennessee? And I realized, oh, this is the silent majority that people are talking about. They're everywhere in the country. Like, it's not just in my backyard in the South. This is nationwide. And I thought, man, he's going to win. And it scared me. I wonder how it felt to give that performance. Like, you're on stage and you're looking out at a crowd of people who are wearing MAGA hats and MAGA t-shirts. Mm -hmm. Like, what's going through your head? It's kind of maddening, right? Because on one end of the spectrum, you're internally wrestling, like, am I a sellout? Am I doing the right thing? You know, how do I make a turn? And so you speak out more. It's like, oh, I got to speak out louder because I got to keep doing these shows. And then you're internally thinking like, what else am I going to do? How am I going to make a living? Like, what what do I do now? Do I stay quiet? You know, what do I do here? It was getting harder and harder to hold back, to keep quiet. So Lecrae started speaking his mind on social media, even though he knew it would be risky. I remember putting up a post where it was kind of like, it was a picture of a Native American getting kicked out by... Um, like someone who looked like Andrew Jackson. It was a picture of the Trail of Tears and a man who had been whipped and a woman drinking out of a colored only fountain. And I said, um, I posted, some people say America's so bad it's going to hell. And then I said, I don't ever remember it being a perfect nation. And I remember, you know, it was just kind of like, 
people were up in arms about that and bringing up the past. You know, you're desegregated. Get over it. You should be grateful you weren't exterminated like you were in other countries. And, you know, it's like that's a that's a literal thing somebody responded with. Um, and just things along that line, um, I, I started to see more consistently. And then I, I was just done. And I remember tweeting on Fourth of July, I believe it was 2016. This is what my family was doing in 1776. And it was a picture of slaves picking cotton. And that was like, that's when hell broke loose, <laughs> so to speak. After the break, Lecrae has to decide just how much he's willing to compromise. Lecrae had made a career turning his faith into music that drew a big evangelical crowd. But once he started speaking out against the racism and hypocrisy he saw in that world, the blowback was fierce. You know, I was seen as a race baiter and I was seen as a liberal and now you're a leftist and the the political agenda has gotten to you and we're not buying your albums anymore and... On and on goes the pattern. You know, I think I lost about 30,000 followers in like a week on uh, Instagram. And I started doing shows. And I mean, where there would be 1,500 people, there were 100 people. And so it was very clear that um, I had touched a hot spot and people were not okay with it. It made me realize like, man, this is this is going to cost me. You know, this is going to be a blow to my career. It wasn't just the fans, either. Lecrae had all of these mentors, big-name theologians and pastors who helped make his career. And after all the blowback, they started to abandon him, too. All of these men who Lecrae had looked up to, who he thought respected him, they more or less vanished from his life. I didn't get any, like, hey, man, uh, what's going on? I found that everything was very transactional. People weren't reaching out. They weren't saying anything. They weren't responding to me. And then there were some, you know, these weren't friends or people I looked up to, but they were just evangelical pastors who outright would send me messages and say crazy things to me. Like, you should be ashamed of yourself and you're causing division. You know, that was really challenging to see that, you know, I think, um, most of the people were saying things like, you're being too political. I wonder what you think they meant when they were saying to you, you're being too political. Oh, I know exactly what they meant now. <laughs> <laughs> um, at the time, I was like, what are they talking about? I didn't even say anything about politics. But in America, those social ills are the leftist agenda. And so how dare you be political you know, stick to the gospel. The gospel is what's going to change this world, not you serving these folks, right? And that's the constant reply I'd get was stick to the gospel, stay out of politics, stay out of politics, stop being political, stick to the gospel. And the idea is that I'm somehow being brainwashed by the leftist media, the democratic media, because I care for the plight of the disenfranchised and um, the racial minorities in the country. And so that was very disheartening. Did you have a sense of how it could be that people who you felt theologically aligned with, like you believe the same things about Jesus, could nonetheless see politics, see Trump so radically differently than the way that you saw everything? Yeah, absolutely wrecked my faith. It, it drove my faith into the ground because I didn't have any context. I didn't know where else to go. You know, I'd, I had bought into this idea that white is right and this is the theological sound space. And now pastors that I had grown up 
being taught from, discipled by, were avid Trump supporters. And they came out and said, we support Donald Trump. And so I thought to myself, if this is who God is and God's people, then God must not be real because this can't be right. And so I took my people hurt and made it a God hurt. Did you ever feel like you weren't a Christian anymore? I did. I remember laying on my floor and just saying, God, if you're real, um, you got to show me something different. And um, there felt like there was nowhere to turn. I can't imagine how hard it must have been to be someone whose identity and art was so deeply intertwined with your faith to feel like you didn't have that anymore. You were you were lost. You didn't know where it was. Yeah, it was um, it was tragic. It was tragic to walk in the house and tell my wife that, hey, I'm, I'm not going to be able to lead Bible study for the kids anymore because I, I don't even know if this thing is true. How did the people who knew you best react to that? Those best friends that you had who made music with you, you know, what did they say when they saw you going through such a hard period? The crazy thing is, is that we were all in mourning. We had all grown up, you know, these unchurched kids who had gravitated toward conservative evangelicalism and it had let us down and it hadn't cared about us or our story or our history. And its politics were crushing us and we were all devastated. And, you know, I have some friends who are no longer Christians now. Just so many different people um, saying, and this is traumatizing and we can't do it anymore. Do you feel like you and your friends and these people who you talk with are the human cost of that tight tie between evangelicalism and conservative Republican politics? Absolutely. Uh, uh, without a doubt, we were the sacrifice made. And what's funny is I can hear the comeback now saying, no, the sacrifices are those babies in the womb. And um, it's just funny to me because I know the the mother and the father of those babies that you're concerned about. And I know the struggles that they have. And no one is trying to change the circumstances that they live in so that they don't have to make these terrible decisions. I won't say no one, but that's by and large not the way it's done. You know, you you vote for somebody who says they're against abortion, even though they never change the laws surrounding it. And then you're done. You don't have to visit that neighborhood where it's prevalent. You don't have to talk to the people. You don't have to counsel anybody. You just have to cast the vote and you're clean. And meanwhile, we all have to clean up, you know, the damage and we're left as you know, kind of the, the shrapnel. We're left with all the shrapnel from it. Lecrae is not the only person who feels alienated from evangelicalism. And it's not just Black evangelicals either. People from a lot of different backgrounds felt gutted by the evangelical world's strong support of Trump and the larger political culture that goes with that. Beth Moore, the hugely popular women's Bible teacher, called Trumpism astonishingly seductive and dangerous to the saints of God. Mark Galley, the former editor of Christianity Today, the magazine founded by Billy Graham, disavowed Trump in an editorial and caused an uproar. Pro-life women wrote articles announcing that their opposition to abortion couldn't justify their vote for Trump. White evangelicals consistently approved of Trump's performance in office, and they voted for him in large numbers. But those statistics obscure all the broken relationships, all the heated church email exchanges, and all of the empty pews left by the Trump era. The political operative Ralph Reed built up evangelicals as a voting bloc for decades, and he played a key role in marshalling the evangelical vote for Trump. My message to Christians isn't, hey, everybody come over here and join the Republican Party. But my message to Christians is to get involved, 
to be a citizen, to make a difference. Reed told me that compromise is essential to participation in democracy, and it's worth it. And there are some who are counseling, well, you guys, you know, because you've gotten involved in the Republican Party and because you supported Trump, too many people see the church as a wholly owned subsidiary of the Republican Party. So you should just go back in your stained glass ghetto. Don't be as involved. Don't be engaged. No, that that's not the answer. Hmm. Do you worry that that reputation of evangelicalism as a wholly owned subsidiary of the Republican Party turns some people away from seeking Jesus or from finding a church home? Not if we do what I just said based on Acts uh, 16. If we're doing all this good work of the gospel and the care for the widow, for the orphan, for the aged, the disabled, the poor, the stranger, the alien— then I'm not worried. Because you know what? If you're doing that work, you're going to be bumping up among liberals. And and people will see that there's more to us than just our political involvement. You know, there are so many major evangelical churches that are multiracial, but there's also a tension point there, which is, you know, when I go out reporting, I have heard stories from people who are evangelical and attend majority white, often pretty Trumpy or Republican churches, Black brothers and sisters in Christ who feel unseen by some of the people who attend church with them. And I wonder if you feel like the kind of alignment between evangelicals and Trump and the Republican Party has contributed to that sense of alienation, especially that some Black Christians and other Christians of color feel from the evangelical church? My sense is that our politics is very polarized. And so any constituency that big is by its very nature, it's not monolithic, Everybody doesn't always agree on everything. And I think one of the things that I'm really excited about, Emma, is that the future is going to look a lot different than our past. It's not going to be as Republican, maybe. It's not going to be as white. Um, The agenda is going to be different. Uh, It's going to be more broad-gauged. We are working more on issues like human trafficking, criminal justice reform, and poverty, and education reform. And, you know, again, I think that's a bright and an optimistic future. I just want to pause on this moment. Ralph Reed, the architect of the religious right, told me that the future of his movement would be less Republican and less white. These are characteristics that have, in many ways, defined this group from the beginning. It may seem like a contradiction, but as Reed told me many times— He's a political operative. It's his job to keep track of the optics. And he's aware that his movement maybe needs a bit of a rebrand. It's also about being more effective politically. So I think it's not only important, I think it's central to our mission. And if we fail to do it, we'll fail in the larger mission. When you look back, do you have any regrets about the political identity you've created for American evangelicals? Um, I've never really thought of it that way. Uh, we've made mistakes. I'm sure that as in the affair of Malchus, sometimes we've wielded the sword when we should have wielded a healing hand. There are times when we allowed our partisanship and our fervor to get the best of us. But overall, far better to have shown some moxie and some zeal in trying to advance what was right than to be condemned by history. The saddest part for me is that, man, a faith that is so pure, that is so transformational, can still be convoluted by culture. Lecrae grew up in the world Ralph Reed helped to create. He became a Christian in a culture where politics and faith were always tied together. But when he started to reject the political part, 
he had to reconsider his faith, too. It really was a period of two years where I had to literally deconstruct my faith and then reconstruct it. Do you still consider yourself an evangelical? I don't. I I don't see evangelical as a noun that God gives us (laughs) to call ourselves by. I'm a follower of Christ. And long after the term evangelical goes away, there will be followers of Christ. And long before there was an evangelical, there were followers of Christ. So it's kind of like I moved closer to those evil liberals that they warned me about and learned that there's some amazing people there (laughs) and, um, and, and said, okay, this is not what you said it was, but it doesn't mean that uh, just because I'm rejecting the hypocrisy of conservatives doesn't mean I'm going to embrace the hypocrisy of liberals either. So then you move and you realize, okay, it's a little bigger than, than you were told. When you look back at yourself Do you mourn for yourself in that younger part of your faith life and and your art career? I do. Um, You know, I think earlier on, I think I wish I kept my mouth closed and I wouldn't have gone through all this trauma. But now I'm like, no, because if you would have kept your mouth closed, you would never have found the freedom that you have. I have long left needing to depend on evangelicalism to provide for my family. I have long left the needing of validation from white evangelicals to feel as if I'm a a Christian or my theology is correct. Um, I don't need that validation. I don't need that financial security. And so because of that, I'm free. This episode was produced by Catherine Wells and Alvin Mella, with reporting by Emma Green, editing by Julia Longoria and Emily Botine, fact check by William Brennan, sound design by David Herman, music by Tasty Morsels and Nelson Nance. Additional tracks performed by Lecrae, courtesy of Reach Records and The Orchard. Our team also includes Gabrielle Burbet, Tracy Hunt, and me, Natalia Ramirez. If you liked this week's episode, please be sure to rate and review us on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listened. The Experiment is a co-production of The Atlantic and WNYC Studios. Thank you for listening.